Hi everyone, I'm Johannes Floros and I want to welcome you all to our paint along sessions. We have some great techniques for you today. I'm excited to be here with you all. I've been a professional artist for over 25 years and I've helped thousands of artists improve their paintings. Uh, probably about 20,000 by now, some of them even professionals. Today I want to show you the, my five most valuable oil painting brush strokes that I've discovered over the years that I've come up with myself, reverse engineering other artists, and all compiled together into, into just one huge toolbox of great brush strokes. You only need about five or six, something like that, plus a few more that uh, are not as common, but with the five you can do a lot. Today I want to show you um, how to do different segments in my paintings. And this is about all of us coming together to build our skills and lean on each other to support. You can all practice along with me or simply watch now and then later on you can play the recording here on YouTube and go back and do your own studies and do your own uh, practices emulating my, my own brush strokes. You'll find the list of materials in the description in the, on Artist Network of this, uh, of this demo today. I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions. Uh, we have someone, Jude is going to help us narrate. Please type your questions in capital letters so that she can easily spot it from the social chat, chat that's going to go on. It's going to be a lot of it today. Um, okay, so let's jump right in and let's start with our first uh, technique here. I'm just going to zoom in on my palette. Just give me a second here. <laughs> my, my face looks funny there, huh? <laughs> Don't get seasick, people. There's my palette. I just have to uh, flip that. There we go. Um, okay. I'm just going to bring this up, make this a little bit bigger for you. And I'm just going to flip it here. Okay, there we go. Okay, now we have this painting up here and our first, first brush stroke of the day is going to be the twist and turn. Alrighty. So we're going to create a, a beautiful uh, sunset there with just a few strokes. A lot of artists professional artists, they rely on just the slate of the hand. They don't depend on um, a lot of drawing. It's just little special effects. So I'm going to grab some fast drying white. There's several brands or this is Graham uh, Fast Matte. And there's also underpainting white from Windsor Newton. I'm going to grab a little of this of cadmium yellow, some cadmium orange. You can see um, the, the, the codes are of the paintings of the pigments are posted there by their uh, letters. So right now you can see this is, for example, yellow ochre pale. And then this is cadmium orange. Okay, so let's start with the strongest sunset right in here. Let me just put my text here so I can read what you, all of you are orange, typing. You can see, um, see the, the... So you're starting with a painting you've already done or not quite finished? Um, I, what I did is I repainted the areas. This was a completed painting, but I'm, I'm just repainting it. So, um, to do the demonstration for today. Okay. So you're going to have a highlight of a sunrise sunset sort of thing. That's right. Okay. Um, we're going to make it nice and moody. Wow. That's a big hit right there. Right, right off the bat. Okay, so here's where the technique comes. I'm gonna grab some cadmium orange. And um, now watch, you go like this. And look how I'm gonna twist and turn my brush to create those effects. Okay, 
So when it comes to these kind of scenes, you want to keep it nice and subtle. Okay, let's put a little bit up in the sky here. I like to bounce around a lot. Um, I'm pretty much, uh, I paint very randomly. Okay, so here's where we're going to really see the technique. So I'm going to start with the tip here. Twist my brush. And just, this is where I said the slate of the hand. You don't know exactly what you're going to get. It's like a box of chocolate. You don't know what you're going to get. <laughs> Remember the movie? So painting's like a box of chocolate. You never know what you're going to get. <laughs> so you have a lot of twisting and turning. So we got that effect in there. This works a lot for all kinds of applications. Uh, for example, imagine that's the shoreline of a seascape, and I'm going to do one for you. Again, twist and turn. A little bit of dry brushing there. Isn't that cool? Very cool. Very cool. These moody paintings are beautiful. I think that they're the best sellers that you can get. Like if you if you're going to think if you plan on selling paintings or even entering them into jury shows, this is the way to go. It's not about the realism that I feel anyway that's going to make the big impact on either jurors or sales. It's the mood that you're conveying. So I'm going to get a little bit of red in here. Now I'm using cadmium red medium. Let's move this over to the top. This way. Yeah. yeah, because you want to get the strongest light there and then it starts to dissipate. How else would you use this? twist and turn brush stroke. You're going to see several demonstrations. Um, another very good application would be for a seascape. I mean the, um, yeah, the, the foam on top of the wave. Can you just imagine that's a crashing wave, right? And then also for um, the beach part of it, I'm not scared to put my hands in there. A lot of professional artists do that. We're going to do a little peeking through here. See, I'm turning my brush a lot, right? Twist and turn. See, I do this a lot. It's all in the slate of the hand. If I were to try to repeat this exact stroke, let's say I had a duplicate clone painting here, I would not be able to reproduce that, that exact stroke. It's all depending on what I'm going to get out of it. So you think the strokes that are per ch by chance are more fresh, unique? What What's the advantage for doing this? Great question, Jude. The thing is, in our subconscious mind, since we were children, we have stored memory, muscle memory, just like when you ride a bicycle, you skate, you can always do it. When you drive a car, you can always do it. Um, we have stored memory of things that we used to do as children, right? And so what's going to happen is that when you do the painting, you're going to tap into that previously uploaded software that you had. So it, we always, we never did this as a child. We always, always held up the crayon and kept it, you know, got using the point of it, the tip of it. This is something new. And so you're not going to produce symmetrical parallel lines this way. It's going to be more spontaneous. So that the point the point is to avoid any parallel line there, right? Exactly. So you're getting abstract shapes and a variety of lines. Well, nothing would be more obvious than you create a parallel line. So this one, for example, the fact that I did that twist and turn here, it's completely different. Like it's not running together. And if it is a little bit, then you just push it around. Okay. Um, that, that's more or less what I got going on there. Wow, that looks good. That really looks good. Let's uh, just, just put a little bit of a hint of a sunset right in there. 
And while now that I'm at it, let's show you the twist, uh, the wispy stroke. Obviously, if the sun's going to be right there at that edge of the hill, you're going to get something like this. So that's sort of like a wispy stroke, which we're going to see later on too. Hope that just fixed that little top of the hill there. This, I mean, that tree, it's a little bit funny looking for some reason. There, that'll do it. Okay, so you got that? Pretty cool, huh? Okay, let's look That's at it. very cool, yeah. very cool. If you were painting this um, as a finished painting, would you put those colors someplace else and use the same twist and turn? Um, can you say that again? Sorry, I was looking for my next painting. If you were going to um, view this as a finished painting, would you put those highlighted colors someplace else? I, well, it already is in the grass. You're talking about color harmony, correct? Uh, yes, yeah, so and would you use the same twist and turn um, brush stroke? And yeah, of course. Uh, it's got several applications to it. And uh, what you're saying is repeating the color. Well, we got a lot of ochre in here, so that will, we don't really necessarily have to repeat that exact color as long as you got the hue here. If this is a, if this is a yellow orange here, this is a yellow orange. Now I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna answer the other question. I'm just going to show you right now from a painting another application of that. We have this sort of like the seascape over here. Okay. We're also going to make this look very cool. <laughs> it's interesting that term cool has not disappeared since I was a kid. Even young children today are using that phrase. So that's something that survived for many years. That's good. So that doesn't age you then. <laughs> <laughs> well, I heard or... my granddaughter use it the other day. She picked it up from school and I said, hey, they're still using that. I thought that would be phased out by now. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just put a little bit of tape here. We'll fasten it. And here we go. So we're going to take white, always start with the white because it's easier to add paint to it not and not the other way around. So I'm just, adding, I'm just going to do an off white here with a little bit of yellow ochre pale. Hey, nice rocks in this one, Joe. Why are the rocks nice? Who can answer? Remember that the viewers are not actually looking at things that are rocks. What is it that, I'm gonna ask the panel here, I'm gonna show off my students for, wow, some of you go back with me 10 years. What are some of the, um, okay, you, we, we know that they're rocks as a symbol in the painting, but why do they look good? Is it just because they're rocks? Because rocks can be very ugly. What is it that, what is Jude seeing there? Okay, so here's another application of the twist and turn. Ready? All with one stroke. Maybe. There's an actual technical reason why those rocks look good or those rock symbols. I think there's several reasons and your students are hitting them. We've got abstract shapes, That's we have it. color variegation, a melodic line at the bottom. That's it. Uh, sharp edges. Okay, here goes the twist and turn. The worst thing that you can do with a shoreline where the foam is meeting the sand is to have a parallel highway pattern. So we're going to do this. We're, I always like to start with the very tip of the brush. So go like this, and then you put the brush, brush flat. Go back to your 
the tip again. See, many artists are plein air painters. They don't have time with the mosquitoes and the heat and to be, you know, standing there for hours doing executing a painting. They only have a few hours. The light's going to change anyway. So that's why you come up with these spontaneous um, slate of the hand strokes. Okay, here we go with this one. Flat. Okay, look, watch the brush tip very carefully. See how I just twist and turn that? There's no chance on earth that by doing that technique, we're going to end up with a parallel line there. No way. Okay, again, flat. Then twist it, turn it. And I'm holding it really at the edge here to be very spontaneous. I didn't apply liquid to this one, Jimmy. It's there, I'm not doing enough painting on it. Oh, you didn't know liquid? Oh, okay. Usually you would. Yeah. It's just and that, you're holding the brush at the end and moving your arm? Uh, there's not a lot of shoulder rotation on this one. It's uh, just, yeah, basically I'm holding my hand... Um, let me zoom out while well, just holding my let me zoom out a bit so you can see and if you were doing this in watercolor you'd be doing it in a very similar action yes and pastels not just watercolor and acrylics all the same okay I, you can see i got my messy table there but that's normal for and i got a little book that says algebra that's holding it high at a 20 degree angle just so that i look smart to you here i'll let you in on that see Algebra. <laughs> oh, this guy reads algebra well. He's when he puts that as a book as a support for his painting. I haven't opened that book in many years. <laughs> anyway, um, yeah. So there's a lot. Let me even zoom out more for you. Osmosis does work sometimes. <laughs> okay, but anyway, it's a lot of it's a lot of shoulder. I mean, a lot of just, this way. I'm just doing it like a robot kind of hand. I don't have to be twisting and turning in my shoulder. Just, but just the brush itself. It's a lot of wrist action, but there are other there are others that where you actually use your um, your shoulder. No, I don't only do landscapes. I do. Uh, as a matter of fact, now you're asking me that. Now next Friday, I'm going to give a workshop on still life. Um, I'll put up the little advertisement later for you but no I do portraits I do I'm a I'm very uh what do you call it I'm like a shopping cart put, put up put, put whatever you want in it still lifes wildlife portraits all mediums very complete anyway you can see I'm, I'm just work this is a little bit too um, how do you how do you say uh, too, a little bit too parallel there but anyway, I'm just working real fast here because I have to fit all this in a, about a half an hour. I mean, sorry, about two hours. So I'm working really fast, which is also good because you become spontaneous as well. It's a good exercise. Okay, now I could do a little bit more of a paint over here. There, that one turned out nicely. There's another brush stroke that I'm going to apply here, and you can do this. It's uh, it's peeling off. I'm going to do a separate one anyway. Anyway, I'll put it up, put it here. Uh, okay, so you just you, it's also known as commonly known as a dry brush, right? So you go, you just barely caressing the canvas. And you can create like a shimmer. Like the, the little, there's a lot of wind back there and it's picking up the sunlight. 
that's a pretty cool effect. It works very well for lakes. Okay, now I'm going to show you another peel off technique. Let's put, put some clouds in there. Normally, I don't like to put white crashing waves or white foam with white clouds because it creates what is called a stacking effect. I can't get into all that right now, but if you start to take my regular courses, we'll elaborate on that more. There's a lot of things that I can teach you and show you, but just maybe you can pick it up on what I'm going to do. But just for, um, because we want to show you the technique, I'm going to do it anyway. So that, what you do there is, let me add a little bit more yellow to this. I think it's important to let them know that brush strokes is just one component of your normal webinar classes. That's that's good. Well, I, I feel my that I'm very strong when it comes to composition, design, problem solving. That's my forte. Yeah, this is just one component. Okay, so we're going to put some clouds in here, and this is the technique. Look, I'm going to okay, put the brush down like this. Pick it up here like that. Don't you wear it, don't use it as a pen. I was going to say wear it as a pen. Okay, so now to create this clouds, look at the brush stroke. I'm shoveling snow. And you can go, you, this is called, there's a combination of peeling off and push and shove. Now watch, watch how I'm going to use it. I'm going to use that side of the brush. I very rarely use this brush like a pen. I could say almost never. Let's put a little bit more. Okay, you can see the stacking effect, but that's okay. We're just, this is just a, a demonstration thing. Okay, so watch this. We go like this, and that's going to peel off now. I don't know why I keep saying watch this. I don't think you have another option. Or maybe if you stand up and go somewhere. Watch this, watch this. Come back to your seat. Don't get up yet. <laughs> Oops, it's a little bit too. You want to be careful with the yellow. See, it's breaking up nicely. You can create little clouds like this just by breaking it up. Now again, if I were to repeat that form on another canvas, I would not be able to duplicate the exact form. It's all accidental strokes. We can say that's the focal point because we have a good light dark contrast there. And I like to stay away from the edges here. I call that the periphery of the painting. Again, that's something that we have to see down the road. The extremely huge, important concept, what I just mentioned there. But then again, they're all important. See, again, this is push and shove, right? Like you push like you're pushing snow, and then shove like this. And there I have my, I have my um, cloudy sky. Soften that a bit. That's also very cool, right? Okay, let's see how we can apply the push and shove. Let's first say for, I'm gonna paint a tree now. Was there texture? Is there texture in that sky? Yes, it, the paint is pretty thick there. That's, that's the only way to obtain that. Oh, and the, and the gesso, not on, on, not on this one. This one's just a flat board. This has texture. Look at that. I use super, I really super technique. Just remember it, super heavy gesso from Liquitex. Okay. So anyway, I mentioned something about... Um, I mentioned something about stacking effect and I mentioned something about the periphery of the painting. All these things that you're going to see in future courses. I have 
Uh, we have this upcoming um, still life that we're going to do this Friday. So hopefully you can make it. It starts this Friday. To find out, you can see right there where you want to maybe jot down that uh, email, uh, that HTML address there. Sorry, I start to stutter a little bit when I'm painting because I'm, I have to go back from my right brain to the left brain, back to the right brain. It, <laughs> Some people say I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that you can even talk at all while you're painting. Anyway, that's this coming Friday. So we'll, we'll get... We've got this autumn scene, by the way, here where I live in Ontario. Uh, we, right now we are at our peak of the autumn. Beautiful. And so I guess this painting is pretty perfect for the time of the year right now. Okay, let's put that tree in. So we're going to use push and shove to block in. Like a lot of these are combined, right? The push and shove and then the peel off. Let's put them together. I think both of them would be applicable in this case. Okay, so rinse my brush. So they're going to use white. Um, I'm just, I, I don't like to use pre-mixed greens, but in this case, it's just faster for me because I it's time sensitive. So I'm just going to grab Viridian, but I phased out using pre-mixed greens now and I resort more to my own mixtures. I think after all these years, I think I finally found the solution to mix really good greens. Okay. So, is anybody else having sound problems? We have one who's complaining that the volume is low. Well, I can speak a little bit louder. How's that? Okay. So here, here basically it's the scrubbing on, right? So you go, Now I only partially mix the pigments on my palette. See so like every two inches, look, watch me switch. When I do that, I'm not actually running out of color, out of pigment. I'm actually variegating, which is another, there's a third concept right there. Variegation, color variegation, number three. Three huge things that will really improve your painting so we can talk about in an up upcoming courses. See, look, I'm shifting colors. This is the push and shove, right? So, because I'm using a lot the brush this way and then this way. Let's see, look, look. Arr, shoveling snow. Something that we're going to do pretty soon here in Canada. Good thing is, I got myself one of those really expensive snow blowers. I'm not looking forward to that at all. I don't know. Sometimes I wonder, what do I prefer to uh, clear the snow off my driveway? On my driveway, by the way, I can fit uh, one, four cars and one motor home, 32 foot motor home, which is I call my paint mobile. And uh, that um, paint mobile, that RV and, uh, and I have gone to I would say practically every national park in the United States and in Canada, plein air painting for months. I've been very fortunate that I've been able to escape for months. For example, I've gone to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, stayed there for four months, painted every mountain that you can put your camera on. So I got a lot of inspiration Okay, so now you can see all the color shifts there. I've had my series of 
experiences like stepping in in bear scat, um, having a, a deer nudge itself against behind me when I'm painting, I'm seeking. I guess they're so common to see people there that the deer will actually come close to you and nudge you for food. And they're not supposed to get food, but it's not, I think some tourists do give them food. Okay, so we're going to do, I mean, let me get a lot of paint here. A lot of tourists taking photographs. Okay, so, so I'm going to load it. Like it looks like you're not putting every single leaf in. Really? Let me see. I'm going to do, let's see, let's count the leaves. It looks like you're scooping it and spreading it. How many leaves did I paint there? I'd say about 100. Oh, there you go, guys. And this is, by the way, the top artists in the U.S. Just for one example. This is exactly how they paint. Big brush, and I can even use a bigger brush. So here's, here's going to peel off. Now I have a fantastic technique when it comes to foliage. I think about the, the numbers on the clock. It's really, really uh, effective. So let's say over here, if I push or shove my brush towards 12 o'clock on the clock, look at the effect it's creating. Here I go to 11 o'clock. Look at that, one stroke. Here we're going to go to 10 o'clock. See, I'm really pushing that brush. So it's a again we can go in we can go into more depth about that in the future how to paint trees effectively without struggle. And like I said, all the top pros, they paint like this. Look at that, cool. Actually, I've painted, I've gone painting with top professionals, like number, number one bestseller in the US, for example, I owns two galleries. You know, the, you watch what they do sometimes, you get some ideas. Okay, I really want to break up the paint here, so let's load it. Let's get let's get a big blob of white, put some yellow ochre pill in there. We're gonna do a little kicker and put some of this phthalo green. What's it called? Thalo, yellow, it's called Thalo Yellow Green. And we're gonna go, I'm not using a medium, nope. I'm using, I'm using these, the paints that I use don't require mediums, they're already buttery enough to do without. In fact, I wouldn't get these effects if I started to reduce these with mediums. Okay, this is, this is the peeling off technique now. We did the push and shove, but now I want to create texture, right? So look, I got like a little crashing wave on my brush, holding it horizontally, and, and just tickle the canvas. And look what I get as a result. Of course, it also helps to have the right prepared canvas, super heavy gesso from Liquitex. Now you don't want to put too much texture. Because I always say a lot of texture is no texture. Because it cancels it out. There's another principle. Here goes the fourth one, right? You, the ones that have been with me for many years. It's called the principle of contrasts. Another huge concept. Someone is asking why you have no sky holes yet. Um, 
you know, sometimes they can break your painting. Now, I can put them in later, and I will since you brought it up. But sky holes sometimes can become distractions. So I would think more in terms of sky gaps, not sky holes. Because think of the viewer as a scanner, the viewer's brain as a scanner. Scanning a document, you're scanning the painting. The more pixelation, the more little things that you put in your paintings, it, it makes the viewer go into an overload to process the visual information. So sometimes it's better just to keep simple symbols, simple forms. I know that in real life, things are quite different than they would appear in a painting. But you need to create symbols now put some in. I guess this is a big one, so we can put a. I like to put them in later because I just I first want to focus on, on the major form. Now we're gonna do another technique that's called negative painting. I'm gonna come back in here now, a little bit of violet, and then do the same technique, which is push and shove. And then I can start to carve out some of my forms. Like for example, this is this can use a little bit. Another there's another another huge concept. Now what is it? Five or six? I lost count. Render everything you can in 3D forms. Exaggerate the 3D form intent in everything that you paint. So by adding a little shadow side to this tree, now I'm making it look like it's going round, even though you don't see it with the eye. It's called rendering 3D forms. Some of these things. Um, are going to really make a big difference in your artwork. When you paint, lines are, and shapes are very important to you. Vital. Do you want to talk about lines of the trees at any point? Yep. Okay, here's another concept. What is it now, six or seven? I think you're up to seven, but I'm not keeping track specifically. Okay, anyway, I have come up with a, and you know what, I haven't read about this, I haven't heard about this, but you will. The whole beauty of a painting lies within the lines. That's the number one priority. Whatever happens within the lines because it becomes an interesting shape if the line is interesting. So this is an interesting shape because the line is interesting. I have determined two important lines in my paintings, in all paintings. One, we can call them a rhythmic line, but within the rhythmic line we have two, or we have two divisions basically. One is a melodic line, and another is a graceful line. So if you follow the line here, there's a roller coaster effect in your foliage, that's much more important than trying to represent things accurately. What line are you creating for the viewer? In this case, there's a melodic line at the contour of that tree. Okay, I'm gonna put a tree trunk in there and that becomes another technique that I think that would fall into the category push and shove as well. I'm going to rinse my brush. Very quickly, I'll put a tree trunk in there. Make it a little bit whitish, whitish, um, whitish, orange. Just, it just, when you have such a big tree like that, you want to give it some kind of a support system. And again, you'd never put, you don't put tree trunks at the edges. I would use a sharper brush for that. I will use acrylic brush for that. The tree, the top, Sherry, the top of this tree is called, it's called a graceful line. It, let's say rhythmic line, and then it subdivides into A and B. A, graceful line. It's a huge concept that will just revolutionize your paintings. Promise you. If you, um, if you, if you can understand and implement those lines, it's going to make a huge difference. And then the melodic line is at the bottom. Okay, so you can see here, follow this. 
here doesn't matter it's all it's all in the learning I'm gonna mark it okay this is a melodic line see that it's like a staircase effect this becomes a graceful line so you can like pretend you're gonna shrink wrap it don't be scared guys that's a dry erase marker <laughs> okay this is a melodic line. When you combine the graceful line with the melodic line, you have beauty in your artwork. That is much more important than trying to represent a tree accurately. And the advantage of that is that you can take any photograph, use your artistic license, and correct the um, the forms. You're not going to be a slave. So this is a put. Th I would put this into the category of push and shove. The graceful line. I see that a lot of you are hooking on to this, right? You're thirsty for this information. Graceful line is like a roller coaster okay and this is a melodic line it's jaggedy you can solve all your reference photos you can solve all your paintings with just that one concept during my live classes because uh, here at artist network we give live classes every month there's three saturdays plus we have this um, still life coming up there's many, many examples. You know what? That line was not very good. It's too straight. So I'm, wait, hold, let me make a correction. I'm glad I caught that. Because one thing you don't want to do is to line up with the border of your painting. So we're going to make it lean a little bit like this. That's the way to do it. Caught myself. So this, this, is the, this is the push and shove. So you go like this. And it brings, look at that irregular bark. Here, let me zoom in for you. See, that's cool. You can do this. So you can see that I broke up by, by doing this way. See how that broke up the uh, paint? So you do, don't use a straight line for your tree trunks, huh? No, you want to make that, you want to break that up, that's bark. Okay, and so on and so forth. It's just a demo, so I'm not going to do them all. Anyway, you can clearly see the texture, this breaking up here. This is your peeling off technique. That's just really, really advantageous in a painting. You can't get that by poking it with a small brush. This is probably one of the best areas right there because of that technique. Okay, let's move on. Well, now that we're at the uh, push and shove, we can do... Let's put a little fence in there using that same technique that I used for the uh, for the tree. So burnt sienna, a little bit of lamp black. But that's that those lines that I'm telling you, you you would see plenty examples of it. Even in still life, that if you look at John Singer Sargent's portraits, for example, you can see that line there. It's a revelation. In all paintings, still lifes, you'll, you'll see it in the next, this Friday. It is the Holy Grail. That's the push and shove? Yes. Let's take the peel off there. It's a combination. I'm all, so you go like this. Okay. 
You know, the worst thing you can do with with um, fence posts is to make them all the same. So let's go. Let's make this go this way. See, the, the advantage of this is getting the irregular shape. Boy, this one really collapsed. This original painting reference photo obviously did not have those fence posts leaning to that degree. Look how irregular that looks. Cool. Now here I'm crowding the foreground, which is a no-no, but I'm just demonstrating you uh, these techniques. But another very important concept in painting is where to put the visual information and where to leave out. The immediate foreground, which is where I'm at now, is not a good idea to do that because it, it distracts the viewer. So another huge concept is referring to um, paint the way the eye anatomically sees is a huge concept. And that's why I came up with the term the periphery of the painting. But again, this is just a demonstration, so I'm not going to be that concerned. You can do the same thing for tree trunks. But one solution is just leave the foreground alone. Now, people might say to you, well, why would you leave it alone? If, that's, if it's closer to you, wouldn't it have more detail? And I would answer this way. How many times have you banged your foot against a piece of furniture in your house because you didn't wear slippers or shoes in your house? How many times? Well, whatever you banged your foot against in the furniture, isn't it closer to you? So why didn't you see it? Because you're not looking down, right? So it's not where things are situated in the planes. It's where your eye is actually looking where the detail should go. If you're walking down this driveway and your head is flat, straight, looking straight, not looking down, you would be able to see all this in detail. This would, not, this would actually only become a concept in your mind. You'd know it's there, but you wouldn't see it unless you purposely were to look down or look aside. So one of the neat things that I've come up with is, is to teach you how to paint the way the eye anatomically sees reality. Not paint what you see, but paint the way the eye sees. And that, again, is going to be a huge concept. I keep saying huge with everything, but they are. I'm not exaggerating. See, I want this bark feeling there. Paint the way the eye anatomically sees. So anyway, getting back, I've done a lot of plein air painting. I think I've done maybe about, without exaggerating, 300 to 400 outdoor paintings over the years. Almost sometimes it's physically in the store. At, le at least it used to be physically in the store. You can walk in and just buy it off the shelf. Some of these concepts I'm talking about, but you need to see more examples of them. Could repaint that area, correct? Say that again. You, uh, you only got. I only got half of your sentence, dear. 
you you put it you put that tree in white because you already had a tree there and you wanted to demo it again exactly i just wanted to show you how you can here's another brush stroke you can call it it's a tapping brush stroke too that creates bark Now I like to do this, again, we put a melodic line on our trees. That melodic line goes everywhere, everywhere. The big masters knew it. John Singer Sargent knew it. He probably never verbalized it like that, but he knew it because you can see by the drapery, the way he applies that. Soroya, Zorn, all the big ones. Okay, anyway, we're not gonna super elaborate on that. Let's do the next one. Let's do, how about we do the wispy stroke? Okay, I'll just put this on while I get set up here. It starts this Friday. Tape it down. We got ourselves a, a really neat mountain scene here. We're going to put some grass in front of it. Okay, just give me a minute. I'm just peeling off the tape here because I have to fix it. You can hear me peeling it off. Righty. Almost. Ah, look at that push and shove technique here with the evergreen trees. Now let's learn how to do grass in a very effective way. Again, just a few brush strokes, it's minutes. Again, it's all in the slate of the hand and I'm so eager to teach you artists how to simplify your paintings make them look spontaneous just with a few brush strokes. Painting should not be taking days. It should just take a few hours. Okay, I, I got this interesting photograph that I'm gonna base my grass on. And this is gonna be called the, the wispy brush stroke. So use a, um, Use a bristle brush. By the way, everything that I'm showing you is applicable for acrylics. There's no reason why that should be any different. So acrylic artists have no reason not to think that they're not benefiting from this. Watercolor the same. I would do the grass with the wispy stroke. The only difference is you would paint backwards and you would negative paint it in. Whereas with oils, you can positive paint it in. Okay, so let's get some white, some yellow ochre pale. Let's put a little bit of a color deterrent there so it doesn't glow too much. I just add a little bit of lamp black, which is not really black. Soroya, Zorn, and Darn Singer Sergeant definitely apply graceful melodic lines to their portraits. Okay, the wispy stroke goes like this. It's like you comb, like when you're combing up. A dog, I guess, a pet. This one's a little bit too solid. Let's do, let's let's do that. Let's do a replay on that one. Do you already have super heavy gesso in the grass? Not on this one. Okay, first of all, this is farther away, so we're going to do this stroke like this. Allow some of that burnt sienna that I put at the bottom to show through. I'm just barely caressing the canvas. And again, I'm stopping because I'm variegating, not because I'm running out of paint. I'm variegating or varying my colors. 
So the way to do grass, here's a technique. Divide into two, well, it depends where. Um, if it's further away, I do three techniques. One is I'll use the peel off stroke for the grass if it's further away. Um, like in this example here, I did it that way. The second plane, which is this is close enough, I do little choppy strokes. This is just a natural bristle brush. So I'm going to do choppy strokes here like this. Little vertical strokes, a little bit like a slant here and there. Not totally vertical. Allowing some of that burnt sienna to show through. See how wispy that is? Pastels is the same technique. You name it. Doesn't matter. Okay, we're getting too much of a straight line there. So that's the interesting thing. I was able to carry these techniques into all my all the mediums. There, that's better. That's the wispy stroke. All right. Would you use the tip of the pastel or its side? I use the side. I hardly use the tip of the pastel at all. I like to use the body of it. I peel off the paper and just go for it. Okay, now let's use this reference. I'll let you watch with me. And we're going to go first. Let's see if we can emulate that direction. This is going to be the first layer. To allow, see, I'm allowing some of that burnt sienna to the show through. Otherwise, your glass, your glass, <laughs> your grass looks like you spray painted it. And I work randomly, as you can see. What kind of brush are you using for this grass other than a bristle bright? That's, Is it a particular type? Well, no, the, the brand doesn't matter. They're all good. Just make it big enough. The worst thing that you want to do is to comb your grass in or use a rigger brush and do blade by blade. This is a much more effective and professional way. Again, profession, all professional artists will do, well, not all of them, but some of the top artists will paint like this. See, it's wispy. If your screen is out of focus, you may need to refresh your screen. There's no reason why your screen would be out of focus. As long as I'm in focus here, you should be good. Okay, so we're going to do the next layer. Okay, so we're going to get some of those strands in there, right? So we're going to get thick paint. What I do is I create a snake with my paint so I can grab bits and pieces at a time. So I'm using yellow ochre pale. And here we go. I'm not even I'm not even using it like a comb, just using it flat. Well, look at the effect I'm going to get with as soon as I as long as I have thick enough paint. This is fat over lean. There we go. That's what we want. I'm trying to emulate the movement. See, I'm creating a visual path now, right? This is a visual path. So I'm purposely creating another, and here's a new concept too, rhythm. Again, you'll see that in future classes, rhythm. So I'm creating a rhythm the way I want the viewer's eye to move in the painting from the bottom in. As far as I'm concerned, the foreground should be the usherer the ushering point, like when you go into the movie theater, that's your entrance into the painting and your brush strokes are supposed to be, are supposed to usher the viewer in to the depth of the painting. Ooh, 
Ooh, those are good. Too bad I got that nice little white touch at the edge here, the periphery. That's not a good spot to have it. But because I'm painting so spontaneously, it, sometimes you can't predict it. Okay, you don't want to look like it's all combed. It's not pet hair. So the beauty is, again, the principle of contrast. You have some areas that are showing this technique and others that don't. Now also, I'm using this as a pointer to direct your eye towards the focal point, which obviously is this. And by the way, this idea of having one focal point, that is not correct. A painting should have several centers of interest. Little, Think about Hansel and Gretel in the forest dropping cookies to find their way out. That's the same thing with your painting. You, you deposit little goodies. So in this case, we have, well, I'm going to put a shimmer here, but we have, after the shimmer, that would be one. This would be another cookie that you pick up, just like in a video game, and that's another one. So it's got three of them, three, three focal areas. And I think I'm done. I think we got ourselves that wispy grass. That's a cool way to do grass. That's on a dry painting. It works best on a dry painting. That's right, Sharon. I mean, you can achieve it on a wet painting, but it's better on a dry painting. Yeah, I'm not actually reading the text. Sometimes I do, but I'm relying more on Jude reading your questions and, and comments so I can focus. Okay, let's... Would you use the same technique for watercolor? Yes. The only, the only difference is in watercolor. Now, when I give my regular classes, I, I work with all mediums. You can request. You can say, Joe, even if this is... Let's suppose this is an oil painting that I did for a demonstration on one of the paint along classes, right? You can re you can do a request, say, how would you do it in watercolor? I'll pull out my watercolor paper, my brush, and I'll do like a 10 minute demo for you. But you, the, what, we, what you do is work the opposite way. I would comb the dark into it. Like you see this highlight? I would, I would go like this with my brush and carve into it. We don't, I don't use mediums in my oil paintings. Sometimes if I use a very thick paint, but no. It's, they're, 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 mediums are just going to weaken the paint and it's not going to cooperate. Okay, this is going to be the peel off. Let's see if I can get this right. Sort of. So you know what I used? Um, I used the brush that had um, some mineral spirits in it. To do this, you want to have a, a, a dry brush so, it's, so it just peels off nicely. But anyway, I sort of got it. Now you can see that the, the, they, the wind is really disturbing the surface of this. I can just subdue it a bit. There we have a painting, folks. Yes, definitely with acrylics, 100%. In fact, let me give you some advice about acrylics. Don't use titanium white when you're painting with acrylics. Just use super heavy gesso from Liquitex as if it was your white. It's got two advantages. One, it gives you much more body, which is a problem with acrylics, that you don't get that enough. Secondly, it takes longer to dry. I don't use titanium white. No point. And it can handle it just like oils. I'll just do a little reflection in there. Okay. I'm happy with that grass. I'm happy with that painting, actually. Yeah. That really... That really... I don't want to take it off the canvas here. I mean, off my board. But anyway, let's keep on going. I'm considering this done. Yeah.
maybe maybe I can come back when it's dry and maybe just add a few of my, uh, these more these stronger lights but be careful because this looks here here's the principle of contrast right this looks good because you don't have it elsewhere when you take that the mistake that people do is they oh that looks good so you repeat it and you think it's like jelly beans in a bowl in a jar the more jelly beans the better so you do that and then you repeat it and then you repeat it and the problem is that every time you repeat a technique it starts to downgrade the first one just like here when I talked about that if I do that everywhere then it downgrades it it's again it's a principle of contrast so maybe I would put a little bit more of that white over here but watch it because you really don't want to go too far because the eye sort of like enjoys looking at that as the exception to the rule you know everything on YouTube stays recorded Maybe, let me see if I can do a little bit more. Of course, that works better if it's dry. See, again, you create a visual movement, right? Let me see if I can get it to the perfection the way I would want it. We're good with time, so. It looks like this is a very light touch brush stroke. Yeah, that's why I called it wispy. Exactly. Because it's just wispy. <laughs> Ooh, that's a good one. Now there's another concept that what makes a painting look good? What's a really good criteria for selecting reference photos? And I think that's where my strength really is. Um, I do a little bit of boasting, but but it's the truth. Um, what 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 themes really work, and how to make them work? What really makes a painting work nicely is think about taking an imaginary line down the middle. Whatever you do on side A should not be repeated on side B unless it's only to echo. So for example, I got some tall evergreen trees here. You would not put them on that side because what's going to happen is going to cancel it out. So getting to that principle, if I add that really glowing highlight on my grass there, my tall grass, but I don't put it on that side. This half of the painting has it, this doesn't. That now falls into the category of principle of contrasts. Now I know it's a lot of information. I like to sing like a bird. You know, when I'm painting, it's like they're waterboarding me. I just don't stop talking with information. But you know what, guys? I'm going to be honest with you. I I was never a really talented artist. I wasn't. All, all I could do was uh, mix paint quite well. That came early to me. But I was not talented. And that's why I had to... The, what made me become a professional is that I went to workshops. I really wasn't getting anywhere. I don't know if some of you have experienced that. Read a lot of books... But I didn't get the, the essence, like this, this, this is what I needed. Um, so what I did is I, I forgot about buying more books and I forgot about um, going to workshops. And I said, you know what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to reverse engineer my, my, my heroes, the artists that I like the most. What do they, why, why do their paintings look so good? So I stared at them for hours and I started to come up with common denominators. Why are they all doing that? And so I started to compile it and I said, aha, now I know what it is. It took me years to do it, but now I'm put, I've compiled all those and I'm sharing them with all my student artists. Okay, we're gonna. This is Lewis Falls at Yellowstone National Park. We're gonna create a beautiful waterfall here. Again, with just a few strokes. This is gonna be. So 
So all those um, techniques, principles, I got them all in my mind and I bring up dozens and dozens of them with every course I give. And students, to, to correct me if I'm wrong, everybody, do you not fill an entire notebook in one session of three, of three Saturdays, one workshop? Yes or no? Okay, here we go. First thing I'm with, let's let's throw in another brush stroke. We'll just call it circular. I'm going to create mist just by doing this. Now this works much better with zinc white because it's semi opaque. Do you ever use specialist shaped brushes to achieve similar effects? Not really. As you can see, basically my workhorses is a brush about the same width of my thumb or thumbnail. I can do everything with that one brush, just different sizes. I do use synthetic brushes for rocks though. I do not recommend a bristle brush for rocks because it, you're getting too much of a, an uneven edge. For that, you use an acrylics brush like this. That would be for my rocks. Nylon. Okay, so that looks like the water is moving a bit. Do you use Chinese white in watercolor? I used gouache. It works better. And guess what? You want to you want to see what's really compatible with watercolor? Um, guess what? Pan pastels. Oh my gosh. You can't even tell that you've worked, you've worked on it. You can put highlights on a tree with pan pastels and you can't even notice. Uh, the, viewers, the viewer cannot notice that you worked on it. And even regular stick pastels are very compatible, but even more so, pan pastels. It's a match made in heaven. Are you putting fog in there? Is that what you're doing? Yes. Yes, I do use bristle brushes with acrylics, Miro. Better yet, you use already used um, oil brushes that you've used before because now that puts puts a protective layer on your bristles. And so the because the water will make the bristles a little bit flimsy, but if you use the brush several times with oils, it's got that protective layer, so you keep it nice and firm. Pan pastels with watercolor is a romance that will never break. Actually, there is a, there's a video, S Scott, you might want to post that on Artist Network, where I do a demonstration of watercolor plus pan pastels, and I, and I apply it with my regular classes as well. Okay, look at the mist there. Of course, that works better with zinc white, but anyway, let me just do a little bit more. I'm, I'm, starting, to, I'm starting to like this foggy kind of look here. No, you don't use you can't use pan pastels with acrylics. Okay. And then, by the way, everything I teach, the only difference with acrylics and oils is how you blend the colors together, but everything is about the same. Okay. So here we go with the first layer of the waterfall it goes like this. You start like this. Now I'm going to be heavy on it. And then Again, hold my brush flat and press and lift so I get a, a lighter value there. Caress it, start heavy, and then just caress. Okay. 
This is your favorite part, Jude. Jude the I love the dried crush effect. Jude the lady that's uh narrating for us. She's a master at waterfalls. In fact, I if she was my my studio here, I would just say you take over for me. <laughs> Thanks, Jill. That's a huge compliment. Thank you. <laughs> you know exactly how much you know really how to apply the the principle of contrasts to your um waterfalls in other words just amount just the right amount of texture also that's the trick is just to get the right amount of texture see i'm starting heavy and then i lift up and that gives me a heavier stroke here and that blends in again you can see it's all in the slate of hand Put a little bit of purple in there. I know that color does not exist in real life, but I'm I'm shifting more and more towards paintings that will be not so much as a sense of copy from nature, but poetry, landscape poetry. Hey, that's a good topic for a paint along. Landscape poetry. My, my, uh, what I teach basically is called representational landscape painting, which is the most common form of painting that you'll see in most top galleries, like Legacy Gallery or Trailside. So are you tinting your white with colors? Right now I am because that's my first step. My second step will be go back with the lighter color and hit that. Yeah, you can do this in, with a wet painting let, linea. As long as you, as long, it's all in how much you you lean on the brush. Now, I've discovered something that's really neat. Old Holland white is so powerful. Old Holland is probably one of the most expensive pigments, but it's so powerful that it overrides um, what you got on there as a white. So if, if you're having problems with the highlight sticking, that'll be your answer. So put some purple in there. That's what I'm saying. I'm, I'm trying to be, my painting is revolutionizing where I make it much more interesting. You don't see purple normally, but I'm adding it. Besides, I'm echoing the color of this tree over here. Here's, here's going to be a typical press and lift technique. Why did you make a horizontal stroke on the waterfall? Where? Here? I'm reading a question. I'm, I'm not No, really they have watching. a diagonal. They're on a diagonal. They're diagonally. It's falling diagonally. Right? Yeah, I don't. The only thing I can think of is it's like following the line of rocks or something, but I see a few short horizontal lines, but not much. Well, if you go, if you Google Lewis Falls, in Yellowstone National Park, it, they do have that angle on them. Only only falls that really go down vertically would be Niagara Falls, but I don't paint them that way because it's it doesn't look right. It looks like a living room curtain when I do that, so I prefer this way. Okay, let's give that now the hit. Here's another important concept. When it comes to white paint, limit your whites. When you limit your whites, things look more beautiful. Then when you clutter it with white, white paint should be limited on snow scenes, seascapes, waterfalls. This is actually not white. Looks a little bit lighter in your video, but it's not white. So I'm going to add a little bit of uh, yellow ochre pale. It's got to be yellow ochre pale in my book because it never gets chalky on you. Thanks for emphasizing that, Jude, by typing in the, uh, you're emphasizing the points with capital letters so they can, they can take note of that. That's a good idea. I'm trying. Okay, so this is where we're going to get. So again, the principle of contrasts, right? 
The white looks good because I'm limiting it to a certain area. I'm very happy with this. I got lucky on that. Sometimes you just look at those little gems. So you see the stroke, it's like it's heavy and then thin. Heavy and then thin. Press and lift. Limit your whites. So we're just going to pretend that the sun is grazing the top of this waterfall, not the whole waterfall. And maybe just a little tad over here, but again, limit, limit your whites. Right. Sorry, I'm saying that so many times, but it's so important because you can't trust photographs in that sense. You might take a photo and the sun's hitting it dead on and uh, you might copy that and you're going to end up with vanilla ice cream running over your waterfalls instead of water. Now, I, it, see when I put those purples in, look how beautiful that looks now. Again, you won't see those in real life, but in a painting, it really looks good. So now we're learning how to enhance colors. See, a lot of... All of your underpaintings have been in oil so far, correct? Yes, because this is an oil demonstration, but it's all the same in acrylics. I can do the same with watercolor. I just have to paint in the reverse format and pastels. And nothing that I'm showing you does not apply to other mediums. And I will demonstrate that in future courses. Okay, now. Here's another thing we're going to do. There are about 25 important pointers when it comes to waterfalls. I can recite them one by one. But one of them is, put a glimpse of rocks. What, how, look how this is gonna, if you think that looks good, wait, wait, what, what, look what I'm gonna do right now. I'm gonna bring this to life. So what I do is I create the veil A little bit darker than that. We're going to sort of show a hint of rocks in between the water, but like a bright, like a bridal veil. That's what gives your rocks the sense of realism. Or, you know what, I shouldn't even use the word realism. I should say more believable. Okay, so I'm thinking, whatever I do on one side, don't do it on the other, because it competes, right? So I got a division point right here. I can clutter more rocks here, but here I'm just gonna echo it. If I take that the same amount of information where the rocks are here, and I start adding it here, it's gonna cancel it out. So you're knowing that principle, I know exactly what to do. And this is also a press and lift. So I'm safe on this side. So it's so interesting how that works. I'm totally safe to clutter here, but not safe there. I mean, when you know that, there's no guessing. There's no guessing in your paintings. You know exactly why you're going to do it. So I reversed engineer, engineered maybe about a couple of dozen of top artists, extracted like lime from a lemon, or sorry, lemon juice from a lemon, and compiled what they do, plus I add my own stuff. For example, here's a, here's a Joe technique. Create different corners. That's more interesting. This is a brown corner. That's a blue corner. This corner is different than this corner. When you know that, you know exactly where to put your clouds and your, and your skyscapes. You put like a, a rainy cloud over here, but here you put the blue sky. 
when you create the four different corners, you have interest. You're not cloning. That one's a Joe technique. But a lot of what I'm doing is actually techniques from other artists as well. Again, just by reverse engineering. Okay, I've got to be careful here. Okay, just echo. Neither do you want to put all the rocks on one side because it looks too deliberate. You want to echo it there. I think maybe we can stop right there. At least for demonstration purposes. That's also... Um, what I'm, what I'm doing here is also press and lift because I go hard over here and then uh, taper off and that looks like the water's running over it. Very typically you can see here how that worked. So you know what? It's all in the brush strokes, right? To create your symbols. Okay, I'll stop right there. There, there you got Lewis Falls. This is a little bit too straight here, but I, I mean, I would work on that myself later on, but I'm just demonstrating this. You keep saying to create your symbols. Do you, can you expound on that? Yes. Touch? What One thing I learned in the reverse engineering is that artists have their own symbols. Their own, they create landscape symbols that represent the real object, not the real, not, not try to do the real object itself. And so we need to build on the symbols. And that's another thing that you would be getting with the classes is how do you symbolize evergreen trees? Here's the problem with evergreen trees. The lines of an evergreen tree are zigzags. Those are very unpleasant to the viewer in real life. So we need to recreate the image to make it more interesting. So we, we get a line, for example, here that's like a roller coaster. If I put the exact evergreen tree with all its boughs like that, then the viewer is going to find that to be very monotonous. In fact, I've pointed out four um, culprits when it comes to lines. Four culprit lines. Straight lines, curves, zigzags. And, yeah, zigzag, curved, straight. What's the fourth? <laughs> let, me get, let me get my memory here. Half circles, half circles. Straight, zigzag. We, um, we avoid those. Okay, this is um, a cat... A, Acadia, right, Acadia National Park. This is um, Otter's Cliffs. And we're going to put a crashing wave in there. With the, I'm going to go back to the, because we got time, to the peel off. Push and shove and peel off. this handy little contraption this is a stay wet palette from master masterton it's an originally an acrylics palette i put a a, a, a watercolor non-reflective glass panel plus a number five neutral mid-value pastel paper underneath i cock it and seal it and then i i can put this in the freezer and guess what your paints don't dry in a month you can you'd save a lot of money I can come back two weeks from now and all my paints will be totally usable. After a month, they start to dry. Uh, you can also put clove oil in there too to add on to that.
Okay. So again, always a little bit of an off-white there. Make it nice and thick. Have you noticed I've used the same brush for everything I'm doing? Okay, first of all, let's put the let's put the dark part. So I'm gonna use just ultramarine blue. A little bit of here's a secret too. Look at look at my palette carefully. I'm gonna magnify that. Time-wise, we're doing very well. I always try to fit in as much information as possible. Okay. Color variegation is what I'm after. Uh, yes, I yes, Carolyn. You impregnate your brush first with oils. And then um, don't wash it too much. Just get rid of the excess oil paint. Let it stick to the bristles, and it's very cooperative for acrylics. Another possibility is just use these the Catalyst brand. That's they are synthetic, and they, they don't have to do that. It's called Catalyst from Princeton. They're very cooperative for oils and acrylics. Okay, so let me do this. Okay, look at what I'm going to do here. I got I mixed two color pools. About this, they all have to see, be the same value. That's ultramarine blue, that's viridian, and I'm gonna add purple. That's just add spice. Remember, I did that to my waterfall. About the same value. Okay, I clean my brush. Clean my brush. I'm gonna rinse it actually. I can I think I can solve the buffering a little bit. Let me slow down the let me just uh change the quality a little bit. Don't don't leave yet. I'm going to bring it down to 3500. I just read that somebody had buffering. Okay, that should work. Maybe just bring down the audio a bit. So yeah, I'm paying attention to your text. No, you're not seeing the painting because right now you're seeing the way I'm mixing. So we got, we got Windsor purple here. We got Viridian here. We got blue here. Now, after that, you rinse your brush, dry it. Okay, I'm going to put the palette back. That's a good thing about these classes. You can see my palette and the painting at the same time. So when I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab on one side the blue, on the other side the green, and on one side the purple. So I got these three colors on here. So when I do this brush stroke here, those three colors are going to show. That's I learned that from watercolor. That's exactly what you do from watercolor, and I carried it into my oil paintings. Don't over massage the paint because you're going to ruin those different colors. So you got a little bit of violet and blue at the same time there and enriches it. So the water just slammed against these rocks here. Acadia National Park is just you want to learn how to do rocks, that's where you go. Besides, take my classes. Because <laughs> um, it's all about the shapes, right? Abstract shapes. Hey, you can't blame me for promoting it, right? But it's true. Okay, we're going to use a twist and turn for, the, for this. You know, let me get a thinner brush for that. 
Now I'm abusing that large brush. I gotta give it up now, let's use a smaller one. So for seascapes, that twist and turn is really useful. So look, I go like this, let off. There's a combination. This is also lift and pull, right? So I go like this, twist it. And the faster you work, the more spontaneous it is. There. I, I just created a crashing wave just with a with one brush, just one solid brush stroke like that. That's like the little eye of the wave there. So when you take these paint along classes with us, you, what you can do is you don't have to do the entire painting. You can just do that little section and practice that and, and learn like training wheels, right? You learn that brush stroke. If you're a beginner. So I, when I give my classes and you're a beginner, I say, I think what you should do as a beginner, just do that little section there. I recommend that. Okay, here we go with this effect now. Peel off. This is the same as with the trees, by the way. Your classes would be great for beginners because they don't have to unlearn bad habits. That's correct. Now, here's another really important concept. How do you know, and you know what? I'm going to boast this because I deserve it. I'm the only one, <laughs> honestly. You hear a lot about abstract shapes and asymmetrical shapes. You got to create an abstract shape. You read it, you hear about it, but nobody actually tells you what makes an abstract shape an abstract shape. And I'm going to tell you. There's a very simple solution to that. Whatever shape you're going to produce, take an imaginary line as you're working, take an imaginary line down the middle of that shape, whether it's a tree, a bush, a rock, whatever, compare side A with side B. If their two sides are dramatically different, you can rest assured that you have a designed abstract shape. So there you go. I am boasting it, but it's true. Ooh, crashing wave. So I'm the only one that's come up with that concept. I've never heard it before or seen it before. But it just just keeps takes all the second guessing away from your work. Geez, I think that's already there. And you'll see that every time you do a tree or something, if it doesn't look right, there's your answer. So, for example, a little bit of a danger alert here. If I take an imaginary line, this little protrusion is starting to mirror that one. That compromises the abstract shape. So by knowing that, see, that way you don't have to fiddle with it and keep erasing it until you get it right. It's, it's not really an abstract shape right now. It's, it's cloned. So I'm going to take this away. Knowing that, now I did that on purpose, of course. Uh, you know, when I make mistakes, I can always say I did it on purpose so I can show my students <laughs> what, what, how to correct it. Which we appreciate because we all need to know how to make corrections. Well, you're never going to know if I actually made the mistake or not. I can just get away with it by saying I did it on purpose. And I'll let you guess. But anyway, it was interesting because we had those two little protrusions that were the same, right? So we're going to take this whole thing as a shape now. And if I put add more here, I think we got it. So you can't go wrong. You cannot go wrong when you have two different sides to a shape. Whatever you produce.
bushes, trees, rocks, mountains, everything. Oh, hi there, Susan. Figures. There you go. Figures. Susan does a lot of figure painting. She's an excellent pastelist. And she sometimes sends me some of her work to get an idea. And I say, Susan, that photograph is not going to work because you have the arms in the same position on both sides. You want to have two different sides to your figure for it to work. So yeah, it works for still lifes, for still lifes, for pet portraits, landscapes, everything. Two different sides to shape and you are sailing. So these brush strokes that you're showing us, a student is saying, seems to me that it should be on an almost finished painting or as a second oh, layer no. to an underpainting. No, no, that's why, remember, I don't know if you were here, but that's why I did this tree, remember? I completely blanked it out. That that was a, that was from the scratch. Um, I'm I'm just doing it like this. These are not these are finished paintings because if I just do it on a piece of paper, it's not going to be as entertaining. This is more entertaining for you to see me complete what one, two, three, four, five, six, seven paintings with just a few strokes. Um, but no, no, no. These these are used for everything. It's not for finishing touches. Like this here, that was originally painted and I blocked, a lot of what I had here, I blocked it out. I repainted this day before yesterday and now went back and put it back. But even, even the block in everything would be the same. Yeah, please don't think because I'm, do, I'm completing paintings that it's only for a completing process. It's done for everything. Okay, let's do one. We, we got a wispy one here. We got a few more minutes. I'm just going back and forth, back and forth. So I think that the, the snow there is pretty plain. How about we add a little bit of grass to that? So again, we're going to use a wild grass technique there, right? We just saw that we saw we, we did that with the full grass, but let's do it on this one. Besides, why would I think it's important to put grass here? Who can give me that answer? What, what do we, we have a certain disconnection between that section and this section, right? It's not, there's no, there's no color harmony there. So how do we harmonize it? We repeat the hue, right? You mark the hue, you recognize the hue, which is an orange, and then you repeat the hue, not the exact saturation, but the hue, and that, that way it ties the painting together. So color harmony, that's another important concept. Okay, your students are answering your question to lead the eye for color variation, to create a path for the eyes to move to the barn. Okay, so that's correct. But if, I'm also going to add to break up all that pillowy snow. Right, but which direction would I put my grass strands? Would I put my grass strands going this way? Or do I create, and here's the tenth concept, rhythm. I rhythm. So that means I would do the strokes this way. Now watch how lightly I'm just going to graze the, the canvas and dry brush some of that in there. We're going to get all kinds of weeds and stuff. Now, you don't want to make it all in the same direction because it becomes too obvious. So, you, for example, I can go this way a little bit. Oh, wait. This is wispy. Let me take that off here. Of 
we're back to the wispy stroke. Okay, now again, down the middle, do it on one side, only echo it on this side. Don't compete. Principle of contrasts. I think I can get away with a little bit more than that. And I'm just, you know, just relying on happy accidents. I got this one got a little bit too marked, but then that looks like a cattail or a, or a um, what do you call it? Bull reeds, bull rushes, got several names. In fact, I can make a few of those. Yeah, sure. Here, here are the initials of my palette. I don't use all the colors. I'm trying to limit my palette more and more, but let's start clockwise. Clockwise is emerald green, phthalo yellow green. Here. I'm going to put a pointer here. Okay, so let's go. Let's start from here. Emerald green, phthalo yellow green. If you go to my website, improvemypaintings.com, you can see some more of my work there, by the way. Improvemypaintings.com, pretty easy to remember. Pluralized paintings. Uh, you, there's, a, there's a materials list there, and you also find it on Artist Network. Um, this is cadmium yellow, cadmium orange, yellow ochre, pale. Got to be pale. That's that works for so. This is this is probably my most favorite color and most used color in my palette. But it's got to be pale. Transparent oxide red or burnt sienna, but oxide red is a little bit cleaner. Cadmium red, medium, ultramarine blue, Prussian blue, Indian red, sap green, which I rarely use, mostly for plants. Viridian, which I only use for water. I don't use it for mixing greens anymore. Lamp black and Windsor violet. Basically, the greens work better with the ultramarine blue, burnt uh, Prussian blue, with cadmium yellow and yellow ochre pale. I mix my own greens now. Finally got it right after decades. Do I need any more than that? We've got to keep it subtle, right? I think that does the job. This is where I sometimes ask my students, do you think I should keep going or should I stop? And I do listen to backseat drivers when it comes to painting. So they tell me, stop. Okay, so I'm going to ask you right now, should I keep going or stop? See, I'm waiting for them to answer. <laughs> how can I go wrong when I got dozens of people being my judge here and helping me out? And sometimes I ask them, shall I add this or not? What do you think? They tell me when to stop, and I do listen. Most of the time, not always. but. I guess you should keep going because nobody's saying stop. Okay, so I'm going to make it keep. I'm going to make it busy. Okay, let's make it busy. They're not telling me when to stop. Keep adding, keep adding. Let's ruin the painting. I need your help. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I, we're never going to be 100% consistent, but I go for the majority of votes. Most people are saying stop, so I'm stopping. Okay, let's learn how to do a wispy stroke for a tree over here, and we'll be done for the evening. I like to do this. They're great. These wispy strokes are great for winter trees. So all those strokes become the branches. Let me zoom in here for you. <laughs> Keep going. No, most people are saying stop. I'm stopping. 
See, they're backseat drivers because they say stop, right? That's what you do when people when you're driving. Okay, let me just put this into focus. Here, let me get this focused. In the meantime, I got to put this up here. You like that? You like that uh, still life? That's next Friday, and that was that will be done in four hours. This Friday, Joe. This Friday. Yeah, this coming Friday. Sorry. Yeah, you need to correct me. Remember, I'm in my right brain, left brain, going back and forth. This Friday. This Friday, the thirtieth. Yeah, just a few days from now. Thank you for the correction. That's fourteen ninety nine. For the full course and you're going to learn some really neat techniques about negative space and still lifes where to overlap how to overlap how to this is somewhat impressionist as you can see how to handle the uh, the tablecloth you can see the tablecloth is also producing a visual path a lot of these principles that i'm teaching are also included and the most important thing with still lifes is where to play with edges you can see that there's a gutsy move right in here See that stroke there? That's not accidental. And see this stroke over here? That's not accidental. And you know why? Because you paint the way the eye anatomically sees. If you put everything into hard focus, it'll look like it was cut out and pasted on with glue. So you integrate it like that and you're detracting the eye from getting glued to certain areas. So there's a play of edges there. You can see it over here also with the flowers. Gradient planes, that's another concept. We didn't even start talking about that. Gradient planes, oh my gosh. That that put, that put pushes you over the cliff. No, I shouldn't say over the cliff because you'll get better. That, that brings you up to the top of the hill. And that's a Pixar Studio technique that, again, I didn't get that from any workshop or... Reading books, nobody. Met. Have you heard? Have you guys ever heard something about a gradient plane in art and paintings? I'd be interesting to know if any of you heard that before. Now that didn't come from me. Okay, so wispy stroke here is great for winter trees, bare trees. Now again, I'm, I'm just combing that on. Following the um, the clock, the clock technique for foliage, 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock, etc. So here we got, here I'll, I'll put that on in a minute. Anchor it to the side so that's, well, it's not floating there. And then we put our tree trunk on. Gradient planes. See, the trick to, to make these really thin lines is hold the brush at the very tip and dangle it. Oh, look at this. You can see I've really got a lot of mileage on this brush. I, I think I'm wrong trying to use such a thick brush to create these branches. See if I can pull it off. Should get a thinner brush than that. Whiskey stroke. <laughs> yeah, you'll probably do a better job with a few whiskeys. At least they won't be so even, right? Yeah, that's a new stroke called the whiskey stroke. <laughs> oh, I have a good time with my students because they make me laugh. Some of them are really good for sense of humor. I actually miss the Saturdays when I'm not giving the classes.
Like I'm looking forward to seeing you guys. Do you use a bristle brush for watercolor to do your trees in the clock fashion? No, no. I use another brush. I use a um, a round. Here, let me let me answer that question. Let me get the brush, the magic brush for creating foliage and watercolor. Too bad we don't have more time. Because I could, I can go on all afternoon. You know what? I, like I said, I didn't have talent. I had to struggle a lot in my art. I, I struggled at the beginning. It was very frustrating for me. I wish I had, I wish I had Joe. That's the real truth of it. I wish I had Joe that told me what an abstract shape is and told me what about lead-ins and all those things. It would have saved me a lot of aggravation. Years. But anyway, right there, you want to create beautiful foliage and watercolor. You use the belly of that brush, round part, and you just go like this. It's the same stroke. Again, too bad I don't have enough time. But if you join me, we have our paint-alongs. I got more time. I don't have to finish at a certain time. I can go out to 5, 6 o'clock sometimes and stretch it and do these demos for you. Um, more than glad to do so. But I, it's nothing for me to grab a piece of watercolor paper and just... I can pop in a tree in watercolor with this brush in 10 minutes. But anyway, you do it like this. You use the, the roundness of this brush go according to the clock and you break it up on rough paper and you you can produce a tree in no time it's all in the slate of the hand like i just did right now so yeah in the previous in the next occasion if you guys join so we have the still life coming up this friday and then on the next saturday after that which is a week from this saturday we have the paint along which is three Saturdays for $19.99. The registration will be posted later. Then we can do all these other things. No, the brush strokes are not described in my book. What's described is some of the pointers that are very important, but not the brush strokes. That, that you need video. You need video and supervision. Oh, and by the way, my classes also include this. This is really cool. The students submit their work to me and I use Photoshop, and I actually tell them where to improve it, and I work on top of their paintings to make the corrections. So I can, in, in a matter of minutes, I can take a tool and, let's say, reshape a tree for them to really understand. It's not that you're just telling them what to do. I can actually show them what to do as if they're right with me in the studio. So we also have that the critique section. Yes, you can use water mixable oils with regular mix oils, but now you've got to sacrifice the water. You can't go back and use the water anymore. You just use uh, the actual, you, can, you have to go to the mineral spirits, but yes, they're compatible. So I'm really looking forward Well, I'm really looking forward to seeing you guys again. It's uh, We had a great two hours here together, and it would be fantastic for you to join. Go to uh, artistnetwork.com slash paint slash along. No, paint hyphen along. Anyway, you can see it there. It's posted. The focus of the next paint along series is called, what was it? Let me Let me show you. I got it written down here with special effects, something about special effects. Uh, my students always want to know what's coming up. A uh, add special effects to your landscape painting. So we're going to do, uh, we're going to see how we can integrate stars, a moon, um, northern lights. How about that? 
guess what? Lightning. I got a, a marvelous painting in mind with lightning, and you can perk up any boring painting with that. And rainbow. How about that? Putting a rainbow in what would... I have a painting with bales. And in my mind, I got the reference photo. And uh, obviously, the... Um, the painting by itself would not be as interesting, but as soon as I added the rainbow to it, it popped. So I call those special effects because you don't usually see those. But this Friday, we got the still life. So I hope you can join us and just check out that website for the paint along that's coming up as well. And um, I hope to see you again, all of you. And I hope you've learned a lot today in class in this session. Bye-bye for now.